Okay, so to begin this class, let's just establish a fundamental assumption. And this assumption will be the concept that virtually everything else I say this semester and everything else you write and think about this semester will be founded upon. In So it's important, okay? And I'm going to be drawing it from a book by Northrop Fry called The Secular Scripture, uh, which is a really good read if you ever have a chance to look at it. One of the fundamental things that Northrop Fry says in The Secular Scripture is that all societies or all cultures uh, have a deep investment in stories and in storytelling, regardless of language, location, place and time in history. It seems to be something fundamental to the human experience. That's a debatable point, as different anthropologists and perhaps psychologists would um, argue. But in terms of the study of literature, the study of language, it's an idea we're going to begin with in this course. One of the one of the consequences of Fry's theories is that if every culture has a deep investment in stories, it's very likely the case that different cultures will value some kinds of stories more than others. And this is because stories are in every culture and society precisely because they are very useful vehicles for expressing basic thoughts, concerns, um, basic thoughts and concerns that are fundamental to the people in that culture and society. So you're going to have stories about you know, how you should live your life. You're going to have stories about how people should interact. You'll have stories about what is right and what is wrong in society. Stories that convey, you know, a basic sense of justice or laws. Stories that convey what injustice is. Um, you'll have all kinds of religious stories within a given civilization. And depending upon who's in power and, and how many people of a particular faith you have in a, a certain area, you will have, you know, radically different levels of investment in certain kinds of stories. You know, for example, if you take contemporary America, um, you know, a, a pluralistic society. Within that society, you may have individuals who subscribe perhaps to, you know, um, an evangelical Christian position, okay? And for those individuals, the stories that are told in the Bible have fundamentally different significance and importance than a, you know, a secularist living without any strong association or affiliation with the Bible, okay, the, either the Old Testament or the New Testament, who may view those stories as being no more relevant or, or, or informative um, than the stories of the Greek gods, okay, so, and they can exist in the same culture, radically different views on reality, radically different views on society, but Fry tells us historically, you know, within cultures, within civilizations, you do tend to find trends where certain kinds of stories are more privileged than others. And the ones that are more privileged or the ones that are more deeply held by the vast majority of people tend to become something like myths in that society. Okay, mythic, a mythic um, event, a mythic story that has all this deep significance and import. Okay, for some people, we have the myth of the founding fathers, right? Uh, it's always struck me as a creepy, faith, uh, a creepy phrase for a nation. But anyway, we have this myth of the founding fathers. We have the, this myth of the constitutional convention. And, and while we certainly have the individuals and things that are associated with these moments in time or places in time, they get idealized and romanticized and codified into these stories that supposedly tell us how we are supposed to live our lives. Okay, so one of the fundamental things Fry is saying, again, is that societies value stories. It's a really important thing to know. It may seem so obvious, it's not worth reflecting upon, but those tend to be the things that are precisely the most important to reflect upon. Okay, so Fry says that civilizations value stories. He also says that there's going to be different levels of stories within a society, and that's important too because of what I'm about to say next. Okay, what I'm about to say now is that if we look back at Europe and we think about the history of culture and society in Europe, we might understand that in terms of this course, the 5th century is a period in time, and I'm not going to be giving you a lot of dates, but the 5th century is a time period that is really, really crucial for our understanding of where English literature come from, comes from, what are some of the fundamental kind of uh, myths that were, you know, kind of baked in uh, to the language initially, and that'll help us understand how these stories have changed over time, and also how cultures have changed over time as they have become more or less affiliated with English literature. So if we think about the 5th century, we might recognize that two radically or fantastically important things happened in the 5th century. And one of them is the Anglo-Saxon invasion, okay, which happens kind of starting about mid-5th century from about 1950, so, excuse me, 14, 450, wow, uh, no editing material to take that out, starts about 450 and, and kind of proceeds for several decades. Okay, we have this, this invasion of um, a number of regions uh, in Europe, but most 
I mean, particularly um, what we would today conceptualize as the parts of the United Kingdom. Okay, That's happening because of something else significant that's happening elsewhere during the 5th century, and which will really culminate in 476, which is the fall of the Roman Empire. Okay, and The Roman Empire once had expanded for a period of time uh, to move into the area that we would conceptualize as the United Kingdom today, but through... Uh, a number of massive social developments that I'm not going to be getting into in this video. It had kind of receded uh, throughout um, uh, the 5th century, certainly, and by the last quarter of this 5th century, essentially falls, okay? And what that basically means is that the largest power structure in Europe, or one of the largest power structures in Europe, a very successful uh, civilization, by almost any estimation, um, crashes to the ground. And when it crashes to the ground, that creates opportunity for all kinds of little warring tribes and nations and warlords and, you know, brutes and everything to start to grab up what comes after the collapse of a civilization, uh, which history gives us many other examples of as well. And that's significant to the Anglo-Saxons and to the region that we would identify now as the United Kingdom, primarily because we start to get all kinds of tribal interactions, wars, and other forms of uh, confrontation that have important significance for language. So in that region, um, we have the confluence of a number of different dialects, uh, Germanic languages, uh, Latin is, is spoken, we have you know, versions of what will become you know, French um, and other kind of regional dialects um, that are all kind of mishmashed together. And within that kind of cloud, of language, okay, and those of you who took the history of the English language with me last semester know that within that cloud, we begin to have kind of the development of what will become known as Old English. Now, Old English is, and as you'll see when you look at the, the selection from uh, Bede in our reading, Old English is hardly recognizable as English at all. It, it looks dramatically different, okay? Um, certainly appears in almost every regard to be a separate and distinct language. Now, I'm not going to be talking an awful lot about the language as such, or at least the history of, uh, of linguistics or all of that kind of stuff in this class. We talked a lot about that. Those of you who had that with, had history of the English language with me last term, and I'm not going to be spending so much time on that topic in this class, but I'm talking about it in this lecture, in the opening of this lecture, because the emergence of Old English in that particular place, in that particular time, becomes relevant to the eventual you know, growth and development of Middle English, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But back to the fall of the Roman Empire and the Anglo-Saxon invasion. These events set uh, the stage for Old English to begin to emerge. Now, what you need to understand is that at this time, across virtually all of Europe um, and in the regions that we're going to be thinking about in you know, present-day United Kingdom, um, Latin is the single most important language to know. Now, that's debatable, but I would say it's probably the single most important language to know at the period, certainly by the time of Bede, who shows up a couple centuries later, as you'll see in our books, um, it's, it's the most important language to know. Why is it the most important language to know? Well, there are some fundamental assumptions that might be good for context. First is that if you're living in that place and time, Latin is essentially the official language, you know, not only of government and commerce, but it's the official language of, 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 of religious institutions. Okay, so this idea that you know, God speaks a specific language and it is Latin it is a little unnerving sometimes for present day people to understand, particularly if you don't speak Latin. Uh, but during this period of time, we have this fundamental um, adherence to Latin as the official language um, of the church uh, and a number of religious organizations that are developing across Europe at the time. Now, why is that important? That's important to Bede, okay? Bede, or the Venerable Bede. I think I'm just going to call him Bede, uh, but many people would refer to him as the Venerable Bede, who basically is one of the first authors to say something like, um, I can tell you a story about how, you know, the beauty of not only Latin, but the beauty of, you know, our uh, Christian tradition can be translated into one of these kind of hillbilly languages that's being spoken by, like the common, you know, the, the unaffiliated, the, 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 uh, the people who don't have really much power in society, the common person um, near an abbey or monastery. Okay, so what he's saying in Cademont's hymn, the story of Cademont's hymn, or one of the things that's being said in the story of Cademont's hymn, is this idea that 
um, the the glory of you know God and the Bible and all of these things um, uh, can now be you know translated through um, uh, to the rest of humanity, translated through Old English. Okay, so he's it, one of the neat things about this story is this idea that there's this very simple man, this very simple peasant who doesn't know like you know all the the vain and idle songs that are being sung in Old English, presumably, right, about presumably things that you wouldn't sing about in church, um, who only knows that language but doesn't know any of those songs, can suddenly receive this moment of kind of divine glory and can be suddenly filled with the capacity to, in that gross little in Old English tongue, uh, spit out beautiful verses um, that are completely in line with kind of the the ecclesiastical understanding of the time, or the or, or the or the theological concerns of the time, and this is the moment that English, or old English, excuse me, kind of steps up to the plate. All right, and it's a fantastic moment because whether or not it's true, and I don't really care if it's true or not, the basic story that we have in Bede is this moment in time. Okay, and it's, we're kind of approaching the early eighth century here, where there's a there's a writer who's saying that you know our kind of Latin view. Of the world or our view of kind of Christendom which is expressed through Latin can now be expressed in this really powerful way through a very common and, and, and long you know considered unimportant tongue okay and so this is the moment where we we step up and think okay this is maybe it's possible to begin conveying some of the the, the, the grand stories uh, in our tradition in this new language. Maybe we can talk about the creation, which you'll see is exactly what Cademan does. But as you get further into this, you'll see that he's instructed by the abbess and other people in the monastery to begin to translate or sing in his own language, you know, the other major stories of creation. He goes through Genesis and he goes through Exodus and he goes through essentially the whole kind of Christian uh, mythology and in so doing becomes a uh, of a new kind of religious instruction, a new and very powerful, literally voice, literally a voice in civilization. So this hymn is crucial, okay, because this hymn is the moment when Old English kind of begins to bubble to the surface of what I would call relevant society. And I don't mean that to dismiss others, but if you understand that the power and the influence of the church during this period of time, and really not even so much that as the power and the influence of Latin at this time as a language. Um, and, for, and for us to have a book uh, or the creation of a text that takes kind of the Latin translation of a poem and an old English version of a poem and puts these two things side by side and, and, and indicates that while we can't translate everything into Latin, and Bede's very clear about that because he knows who he's writing to, uh, while we can't translate everything into Latin, while the translation would be imperfect, because Latin is essentially perfect, right? From, from that point of view, um, we have the beginning of something really dramatic here. Now, you don't need to have any religious feelings to see that as a grand moment, okay? You don't need to be deeply dedicated to those stories, to the Catholic tradition at all, to understand that this moment is significant. All you need to understand is that in this moment, we have a culturally ascendant language or a culturally ascendant power looking at a you know, uh, conceptually inferior uh, form of communication uh, from the position of the Latin speaker and the Latin thinker and saying it's possible to use this language to get our basic thoughts, concerns, hopes, and dreams across to people. And that's really beautiful, um, regardless of your, of your religious background, or at least that's, that's what I would say. Because one of the things we have here is this recognition between languages, okay? There's this recognition that one language might um, be able to utilize another, or that they might be in conversation in some way, and from that we might get an important story. And this is particularly important for a bunch of a bunch of you know reasons. One of them being indicated by my earlier comments, you know, holding and controlling power um, in this region at that time is not an easy thing to do. You're very far from the sources of you know wealth and influence in continental Europe if you are bead living in uh, Northumbria at the beginning of the 8th century. Um, and so there appears to be some kind of compromise uh, in this story where you have somebody saying, you know, the common people can come and they can tell us 
the official story of creation as well. And we might interact with them and we might use them and they might be reasonable enough for us to share some perhaps uh, authority or at least perspective with these individuals. And I may be overstepping things a little bit there, but I just want you to get a basic sense of how great this moment is. Okay, in, in terms of history, but also in terms of the language that you wake up and speak. Now, when you get up in the morning and speak, you certainly don't speak Old English. Uh, and you certainly don't speak Latin. And while there may be traces of those languages in your everyday conversation, um, I don't think any of you would, would necessarily you know, get up and... Well, some of you might say carpe diem. I don't know. Do whatever you want to do in your house. But most of you probably don't say those things first, first thing in the morning or last thing at night. So, in Bede, we have this basic notion that English... Old English can be used to tell stories. Okay, that's important for the canonical selection, which is what the bead reading is. In terms of the kind of uh, apocryphal, okay, uh, selection that you will be using, I want you to carry that idea with you because as you get into these early uh, Anglo-Saxon stories, what you're going to see is this effort to tell a story one story or another, and usually within these stories or within these conversations or within these poems, there is a deeply Christian uh, perspective. Um, we're not going to be reading Beowulf um, in this class. Many of you have read Beowulf before. Some of you have read Beowulf with me. If you know Beowulf, one of the fundamental things going on in that piece of writing is this idea that you have these various different languages that are now being kind of yoked with this you know, Christian perspective from around the 7th uh, maybe 8th century, maybe 6th century um, in, in, in continental Europe. And now that's showing up kind of in the, in the hinterland regions, um, you know, what we again refer to as present-day United Kingdom, um, but which at one point will span literally the globe in terms of its power and influence. But anyway, at that time, um, these are early works that are trying to find some middle ground between various languages, and basically Old English kind of wins the lottery, okay? Not to minimize um, it and to suggest that it was random, but there's this moment where we have this recognition that this essential new form of communication might be of some value. Now, I don't want to cheapen that by making some, you know, really shallow contemporary association, you know, the worst thing I could probably say right now is it's just like text speak in present day society, which is kind of the hacky thing to say, uh, kind of the fawning, you know, uh, you know, pro technological thing to say. But nevertheless, I think it is important to think about, you know, the various kinds of language that you encounter in everyday life. Let me just give you a real brief example from my own. And this may upset a number of people, but I think it bears uh, it bears sharing, particularly because I'm, I'm, I'm from New England and I grew up in New England and I teach in New England and I'm amazed by the um, uh, proliferation of what I would call kind of Southern uh, American English phraseology um, in, uh, in, in New England in the last quarter century, okay, um, which is now virtually everywhere. In fact, most Mainers who I would have expected to sound like Mainers a quarter of a century ago no longer sound like they're from Maine at all. Very few. Um, people have either adopted a broad television accent, um, which is basically my way of saying how so many people on television seem to pronounce things uh, in, in the same way. Um, or they might be, you know, dropping G's everywhere they go in their language, you know, running, r r running instead of running and all of these things. And, and one way to look at this, this transformation, besides the fact that I find it slightly hilarious, but, but one of the ways to find this transformation really informative isn't, isn't to think about it as, you know, um, some long, you know, lauded and idealized uh, New England tongue kind of crashing and burning under the rise of NASCAR. And you put, no, that's not what I'm trying to get at here. But what I am trying to get at is you can pay attention to language in your own day-to-day -day interactions and through those interactions begin to get a sense that language is really, really fluid. Like when you're a child, they'll give you a dictionary and they'll say dog means this, cat means this, house means this, you know, car means this. And by and large, that's probably going to stay the same. But but the way in the ways in which people talk, the phrases that they use, the way they structure their sentences, the terms that they use um, as they interact with each other are extremely fluid. Okay, extremely fluid, and that's probably a good thing. I would say uh, when your language freezes up on you, um, you're in trouble. Now, to come back to some of the subject matter that's maybe also relevant to this opening lecture, the story of the rise of Old English and eventually Middle English and then you know other forms of English is also the story of the death of Latin. Um, Latin uh, rises up for a significant period of time as the definitive tongue uh, 
um, for the Western world, and then that comes to an end. Now, I don't say that to scare anybody, but if you, you know, are aware of life cycles of people, places, and things, it almost certainly means that the language that you and I are speaking right now uh, will one day be virtually useless uh, in the world. Um, and I don't mean to be too grim, but that's probably going to be the case. Uh, it'll probably be so transformed um, over, you know, uh, the next several dozen decades or centuries that it would be hard for us to recognize it and understand it if we were to come back to life 700 years in the future, a thousand years in the future. I don't say that as a simple kind of joke or, or one-off. I say it to kind of underscore the first point I made in this lecture today, which is the relevance of stories to society, okay? Even though the language is going almost certainly to change dramatically from decade to decade, century to century going forward, one of the things that's really important about Fry okay, is Fry's argument that cultures and stories remain, excuse me, stories remain culture, uh, relevant to cultures. Let me rephrase that again. Stories remain relevant to cultures, you know, no matter what language they speak, no matter when they exist in time. So even a thousand years in the future, even 5,000 years in the future, perhaps even longer if we're still around, there'll still be this basic, according to Fry, need to express stories regardless of the language that's being spoken at the time. And the shape those stories take, okay, the shape those stories take is always fascinating because it tells us a great deal about the culture that we're in and also where that culture has been and also where that culture wants to go. So while it's speculative to think about the future, we can turn around and look at the past with that perspective and we can start to get to work. We can start to make some meaning. We can start to try to figure out, you know, what were these people concerned about? What were these people trying to say in their day-to-day -day lives? And what's important about what they said to where we are today? And that, for me, is one of the fundamental reasons to get excited about English literature, besides the fact that you're going to find so much language that is just overwhelmingly, well, it's just so well-written and persuasive and imaginative and insightful that it is in and of itself rather stunning. But all of that aside, okay, we can take some sense of security in the relevance of stories to society. It's one of the things that we appear to be able to be fairly confident about. No matter which society we might wander into, stories will be important there. And that's a fundamental human connection that you don't get in all disciplines or in all modes of thought. The idea that no matter where we come from, there are relevant stories and it doesn't matter if we have a particular religious point of view, completely, you know, um, disengaged from religion point of view. Um, at the end of the day, the human animal needs its stories, uh, just like someone sitting down to watch soap operas. Okay, that's a bad joke. I'm probably at the end of this lecture. I hope the points are clear. And I'm looking forward to our next lecture as well.